Welcome to the Houdini Hulai Challenge series. So side effects is holding a 31 day challenge where artists create a piece per day based on a daily topic. I've decided to take on the challenge and record each day's work so that you can see the process. I'm doing this so that I can challenge myself and I'd recommend that you do the same. So let's get straight into it. Howdy. Today is day 11, squash and stretch. This one I Honestly, I have no idea what I'm doing. I was thinking about it. I gave it some serious consideration and I just I couldn't, nothing came to me. I was thinking of doing the sort of Nike um, air bubble thing that they do for the, the uh, Nike airs. And I thought that would be interesting. I considered making a very high quality render and just letting that shine, maybe do some nice texturing. But I, I don't know where I'm going. So I'm going to go into Houdini, mess around for a while, see what kind of ideas I come up with, and then take it from there. All right, so this is after I'm finished with the setup. I'm just going to take you through it. Um, I find that this is probably the best way to do it, show you a bit of a time lapse so you can see how it goes, um, just me messing around, the kind of things that I play around with, and then just take you through it at the end so that maybe you can pick up some tips and kind of get an idea of workflow. Um, it seems to be a good way to show you, so yeah. All right, uh, initially what I had was this turd over here and I scattered some points, copied points, and I messed around with um, turning them into cloth firstly, and then gluing them together. So they stuck together, and then I used the vellum pressure. And I was playing around with it, and I thought it would look really good if it was iridescent, um, like a, a kind of metallic with varying colors in its reflection. And then the more I played around with this, the more I realized it started to look like balloons. And that made me think of Jeff Koons, and he's an American artist, and one of the things that he's extremely well known for um, are these giant sculptures of, of dogs. He does these big balloon dog sculptures, and I think they're made out of aluminium. Aluminium for anyone in America. I always found that weird, but anyways. Big aluminium dogs, and they're super polished and shiny. It's really interesting. I was like, let me, let me make that. So then I gave it a go. I started by creating some dog geometry. Um, super simple. It was all just a bunch of spheres, you know, mirrored and put together. This is attaching the nose and that was a bit more complicated, but I'll get back to that. So it gets remeshed um, so that it's better for vellum. So generally you want triangles for vellum. I'm not sure the reason why. Um, I think it's because of the way triangles can bend, but you want triangles for vellum. So a remesh always works pretty well. You turn that into a vellum cloth and then I pin the feet so that it doesn't move too far out of place, but it's a soft pin, so it has some room to move. I then glued these pieces together. So the cool thing with the glue is that you don't have to define which pieces to glue together, it just glues whatever's close. So all of these pieces get glued together. Then I use a vellum pressure. So 
it figures out pressure constraints and it puts constraints in the inside. That gets output to Geo and constraints. So this is how Vellum works. You have Geo and you have constraints. Constraints control things like internal pressure, um, struts, or pinning. So the other thing that I do, I add this called original stiffness and I make it equal to stiffness. That becomes useful later. Anyways, I take all of that into a Vellum Dynamics network. Now I'm not going to let this cache, but it starts caching from negative 90. The reason is I need it to flatten, right? It needs to fall flat. And the way that I do that is by keyframing pressure and by keyframing rest length. So basically how it works is you can decrease the rest length of all of your constraints and your dog will shrink down, right? So what it's doing is it's shortening each one of these connections. So for example, say 0.3470 is connected to 3471. The connection between these would shorten based on this rest length scale. So if it's 0.5, it'll be half that length. And that's true for all of them. So they all start shrinking down. However, you can also target a particular type of constraint. It doesn't have to be, like this is the cloth constraint, right? The one that you see on the outside. It's just the one that makes this function as cloth. But you can also target the pressure constraints. And that's what I do in the second one over here. I say at type equals pressure. All that does is if it is a pressure constraint, affect it. So you can see how it's keyframed. I let it drop so that it loses all of the internal pressure. So basically it deflates. While that's happening, I also decrease the rest length. So I let that run for a couple of frames so that by frame zero, it's flat on the floor, right? That looks like a deflated balloon. Rest length scale 0.01 for the pressure. So there's no pressure inside and a low rest length over here. So that works pretty well. That makes it look like a deflated balloon. The vellum constraints for pressure, that one jumps up and then down. So that gives it that sort of pumping look. So it pumps up and then drops back down, pumps up, drops down. And then from here, it goes up, right? And it goes to 1.5, so it over inflates. And then it comes back down to 1.2. And I don't use one. I like to use a slightly higher rest length scale for pressure. So that it looks kind of taut, it looks tight because it can look kind of still flimsy if you put it at one. So I like it to look like it's fully inflated. So I always put it slightly higher. Um, the rest length scale, that's also keyframed. So the balloon grows. It gives it some room to grow, which is nice. So that's pretty okay, kind of straightforward. Only other thing is a reduction in time scale and a very low velocity damping. Low velocity damping is important for something like this. When you have high velocity damping and you try to make effects that are quite quick, like the inflation, it, it destroys your, your simulation. Velocity damping is really good for something like yesterday's one, where I made the slow moving pieces of cloth. That's what it's really useful for. Anyways, I also have two sub solvers. So sub solvers are pretty cool. We know that geometry comes into a vellum network. And we also know constraint geometry comes into a vellum network. And so on your sub solver, you just, you just type this, you just type sub solver. By default, it comes in calling geometry but you can change it over there to constraint geometry and then it affects constraint geometry. And so if we go inside here, you can see that this one is targeting geometry and this one is controlling constraints. So in this one over here, I basically have just a little thing that when this dog is inflated, it also corrects its position. So it moves into that sort of rest position. You can see over here, I say look, V at rest between these frames. So between frame 192 and 216, it tries to get into that original position. So that just makes sure that it isn't like floating off into the distance. It kind of just pulls towards its starting position. This V at V equals zero. I do this so that there's no residual velocity between frame minus 10 and zero. So that by the time it reaches frame zero, it's completely static, right? Your geometry is not moving at all. So it looks like it was set up in that position. Then on the constraint side, all I do is I keyframe the stiffness. This is where I use that original stiffness. So you can see yeah, I'm targeting the type of constraint. I'm saying if it's not of type stitch. Stitch is the one that's glue. It's the one that joins all of my pieces. If I had to target this as well, then all of my glue constraints would come loose. But what I'm doing here is I'm saying stiffness equals the original stiffness times this multiplier. So this multiplier is keyframed, right? So it drops. So this balloon loses all stiffness. So it becomes floppy, right? It, it loses any rigidity. Then when it reaches frame 120, it starts ramping up so that it regains its rigidity and I even increase it. 
so that it remains quite rigid. So that's all that goes on in this vellum network. And I'll show you what you end up with. You end up with this over here. So you can see this is actually the minus 90 frames. So it collapses in on itself. It looks weird for a bit, but then it steadies out. And by the time you reach frame zero, you've got this nice static geometry, right? And then you can start doing all of your work from there. So I'm going to set this back to frame one. Then if you play this back, you'll be able to see it just does this inflation thing. And you may be looking at this and thinking that it's a very low resolution simulation. But that's what's really cool about Vellum. And actually, a lot of the dynamics networks in Houdini is that you can deform a higher resolution geometry with the lower resolution one. So what I do is, where I set up my dog geometry over here, I do this thing called a cloth capture. What this does is it takes the cloth that you're feeding into the dark network and it takes your high res geometry, right? So I also just gave him a little nose. It's um, just a bunch of tubes and that. Cloth capture, it makes these things around it. This is basically just a visualization showing that this piece of cloth affects this piece of geometry. So obviously the nose isn't part of the original geometry, right? Part of the simulation geometry, but you can see that it's included in the capture. Then I do a separate one for the tail because when you make cloth capture too big, it slows everything down. So this radius is at 0.3, but to include the tail, which extends quite far out, I would have to make it like a radius of one and then the calculations get slow. So I do that one separately. I cloth capture the tail with a very high radius, right? So that just gives you the tail, put the tail out, dog out, dog geo. And then all you have to do is bring in the static geometry that goes into the network, the high res dog, and then you cloth deform. So all the cloth deform takes is the static cloth, the deforming cloth, and the high res geometry as the first input. So your high res geometry now gets deformed. And then I do the same with the tail on the side, merge them together. Um, for some reason it's messed up over there. I, I don't know what I did to break it now. Um, <laughs> I have no idea why that tail's up there. Uh, I think I just changed, it's probably this. Yeah, okay, so there's my tail fixed. Then I file cache that out. Just do a couple of things over here to fix it up. Oh, I do the tail wag in post, just because it's easier. I do the tail wag here yeah, with this bend. So I just keyframe a bend with a bend attribute so that over here, the tail starts wagging. Just done with a bend node and a sine curve. So you can see it goes back and forth. That's all cool. Then I cache it out again. You end up with the higher res geometry. And now you can see it looks pretty clean, right? It doesn't look as sharp as the other one. And then my dog, he just uh, sits up and his tail wags. So dog geometry out. This is the part that I actually want to show you because rendering this was the interesting part because that's what really makes it look nice. I, I really like the way that this one looks. So let me show you. Open render view. This is using Redshift. If you're not using Redshift, I'm still going to give you kind of a useful tip, an interesting tip. So if you take a look at this dog, he is what is known as iridescent. Iridescence is this variation in the color depending on viewing angle. So you can see that it's this light blue at the top, almost teal towards green, dark blue on this side face, and then purple towards the bottom. And it's not purple because of the floor. Like I can show you if you remove the floor, right, it's still got that purple underneath. So that color is from the shader, not from the ground. So I would like to show you something interesting. I'm just going to scale down this little render, go into the material network and into the dog material. So I'm not entirely sure how you would do this in Mantra, but in Redshift and I assume other renderers, there's a very easy way to get the normal direction, but you don't want the normal direction of the geometry. You want the normal direction of the camera. So you use RS state. And what this does is it fetches the normal direction from the viewing angle. So then you remap it between zero and one from minus one and one, because normals generally go from minus one to one. It could be X, Y, and Z, but it can be negative or positive on any of those axes. So you need to change it from negatives to just a zero value. That allows you to put it into a ramp like this. And with this, you can control the different colors. So I'll show you, you can make it whatever you want. Let's make a yellow and pink dog, a bit of orange. So you see what I mean? You end up with this pink color at the top and the yellow on the side um, and the orange color towards the bottom. And to understand this, I, I, can actually, I can actually draw it for you. So let me do that. How I assume this works and 
And if you know how this actually works, and I happen to be talking nonsense, feel free to correct me in the comments. I, I promise I won't get upset if you if you correct me. I, I prefer to learn than to be wrong. So I assume this is how it works. You have a camera, right? So this is your camera. It has a viewing angle, viewing angle like that. Then you have this geometry. So I'm going to use a sphere because it's probably the best way to interpret this. This camera, how I assume this works, is that it shoots rays, or it's based on rays of light that are reflecting into it. So either way, it's either rays coming from a light source or rays from the camera. So your normals would look something like this. So those normals are going from one at the top. So this would be one at the top. This would be minus one at the bottom. Then everything in between is a sort of variation of that. And it'll also be an in-between value. So this is both x and y, so this is y. So it's actually zero comma one, right? And zero comma minus one. And then here it would be minus one comma zero. What happens is if you're remapping this, then it goes zero comma one to zero comma zero and zero comma zero over here. And you have this shape. This is perfect for a channel ramp. So what that means is this value is now a range. As you can see, it's a range of values. So if you feed all of those into a ramp, and this ramp happens to have a bunch of colors like this, then the renderer can tell which color to color the surface of the sphere based on the normals. So over here, it would be that sort of blue, right? So you end up with this gradient. So this is how I assume iridescence works. This theory makes a lot of sense to me. Um, it might be wrong, but either way, the analogy is still correct. And so if you had to change your viewing angle, so if you had to look from down here, right? So that viewing angle, then the normals are all different. So then once again, because of the new viewing angle, it might be something like this. And so those ones over there would be purple, top ones would be blue. So that's how iridescence works. And so you just plug that straight into your reflection reflectivity. That's the color for reflectivity you can see over there. And so I chose these colors over here because I, I like these colors or I like it in this case. That, that's actually something when I never know what to say when people ask me what my favorite color is. It, it kind of depends. For example, I really like these colors, the sort of fuchsia and azure with the teal when it's metallic, uh, but it reminds me of like baby blankets when it's when it's matte. And so I think color is kind of contextual. You know, if you're out in nature, you want the canopies of the trees to be a, a beautiful green. But if you get a burger from McDonald's, you don't want your patty to be green. You get what I'm saying? Like a, a yellow rose means friendship, but if your eyes are yellow, it means you have jaundice. Maybe I'm overthinking. Sorry, I'm going on in my rants again. But yeah, so these colors seem to look quite nice. I really like the way that they look when you render them. Right, super pretty. Um, and I don't really do anything in the compositing stage. I just add some grain, do a bit of a cleanup. Um, but that's, that's all there is to this one. And the final render looks like this. So once again, thank you for watching. I hope you found this one uh, kind of interesting. This one was quite simple. It was just a lot of keyframing. So that's mostly what took up the time is that I wanted to know where to keyframe my pressure so that it looks like it's sort of inflating. So, you know, for a more interesting composition. I just want to say thank you. You've all been amazingly positive in the comment sections and on Instagram. It's all been a lot of fun engaging with you guys. You're all awesome. So thank you for that. Um, one thing, actually, now that I'm on it, I, I need to bring this up. You see this over here? So this over here is watch time from subscribers. I see that you're watching me. So just know that I'm watching you. This 58% not subscribed. Just, just click the button. Just click the subscribe button. But yeah, only if you want to. Anyways, thanks for watching. I'll see you tomorrow. Uh, tomorrow is fur. It's probably gonna be cute. Let's be real. It's it's fur. It's gonna be cute. So I'll see you tomorrow. Bye.